Hello, 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 everybody. Uh, how to deal with anxiety. That's this week's topic on the, the podcast of the stand-up philosophers. It's often said that the philosophy out there that doesn't do any good, that doesn't heal any, anybody, that doesn't bring anybody any tranquility or peace of mind, doesn't improve human existence, is a failed philosophy. Uh, let's take a look now. In the bustling modern world, anxiety has become an increasingly common mental health challenge. Uh, fortunately for us, ancient wisdom offers valuable insights on how to navigate this overwhelming emotion. Stoicism, a philosophy that emerged in ancient Greece and Rome, provides practical guidance for individuals seeking to cultivate inner tranquility. The ancient philosophers of which had a profound influence on the present-day field of psychology, and in particular CBT, or cognitive behavioral therapy. This video aims to explore how a Stoic would approach and deal with anxiety, uh, ultimately paving the way for, hopefully, a more serene existence. Anxiety is a complex and multifaceted emotion that can manifest as a feeling of unease, worry, fear or apprehension. It's a natural response to stress or perceived threats commonly experienced by individuals in various aspects of life. Anxiety can arise from a range of situations, such as upcoming exams, public speaking engagements, social interactions, personal challenges, and so on. So if you've got to stand up in front of the school, uh, read out an essay or something, that can cause anxiety. If you've got to speak at a funeral, same thing applies. You know, if, if some people, they're okay with it. They don't mind. They're not bothered at all. It does, doesn't interfere with them. It's not even on their radar as a source of worry. Other people, because everybody's different, other people suffer with this type of thing. Uh, the thing to understand is that anxiety is a normal human experience. It can become problematic when it becomes chronic, excessive, or interferes with daily functioning. Anxiety disorders, such as generalized anxiety disorder, panic disorder, social anxiety disorder, and various phobias, are characterized by persistent and intense anxiety or worry, feelings of stress that may be disproportionate to the actual threat or situation. These disorders can significantly impact an individual's quality of life and often require professional intervention and support. The symptoms of anxiety can vary from person to person but commonly include increased heart rate, rapid breathing, sweating, trembling, muscle tension, headaches, stomach aches, fatigue, restlessness. Uh, when it comes onto the, the, the mind as well, that's most effective with excess worrying, racing thoughts, difficulty concentrating, fear of losing control, anticipating the worst, and other obsessive thoughts. Emotional symptoms, feelings of apprehension, irritability, restlessness, sense of impending doom, difficulty relaxing, and a constant state of tension or unease, they're common as well. And of course, then we get the behavioral symptoms, which are really, really life damaging. For example, the avoidance of anxiety provoking situations, the seeking of reassurance constantly, uh, repetitive behaviors such as compulsions, social withdrawal, and difficulty making decisions. It's important to note that anxiety is a treatable condition and various therapeutic approaches, such as cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT for short, medication, mindfulness techniques, and lifestyle modifications can help individuals manage and alleviate anxiety symptoms. Seeking professional help from mental health practitioners is crucial for proper diagnosis, guidance, and support in addressing anxiety-related concerns. So in other words, I'm not a doctor. If you've got any, um, uh, any major concerns, then you should obviously speak to a specialist, someone who knows basically what they're doing, as opposed to someone like me who is just a guy on the internet, um, just issuing general advice, basically, uh, based on my own self-experience, of course, because uh, it needs to be said that anxiety is something that I've suffered with a lot. Uh, my own father basically was um, an agoraphobic, uh, and the problem when you live with an agoraphobic uh, so they are full of anxieties about the outside world. It's not a safe place. Uh, and they project those anxieties onto everybody else that they, they, that they live with. And that turns you into a bit of an agoraphobic as well. Um, to this very day, I'm not fussed on traveling. Don't tend to like to go anywhere, even though I'm not frightened of going outside. But like I say, I love my father. He's been, he was a wonderful man uh, when he was alive. God bless him. But, you know, it, it does cast a long shadow over everybody else that you live with. Um, and I, I've always been, until, until I discovered philosophy, I've always been the type of guy who would worry anyway and was just a natural stressor 
when it came to anything that might cause me concern for for the future so i'm not like reading this stuff or stuff out for you from a script um and i'm not like one of these assholes that you find on the internet who's happy clappy and you know thinks that he can change the world by giving you sort of advice if you like and things like that um uh you know i'm not one of those guys I, i've suffered uh and i've got lived experience when it comes to things like this um and um I, you know i wouldn't want you to think that i'm some sort of holier than thou sort of idiot you know that um it's just preaching, basically. I, I know how difficult it is. That's all I'm saying. So, moving on to that. CBT, or Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, is itself derived in part, well, mostly, actually, I would say, from Stoic practice. The ancient Stoics were masters of the mind, uh, and they learned to practice indifference to any and all events, even death itself or the impending threat of it. it would, wouldn't make a dent in their ataraxia or their peace of mind. To comprehend how Stoics handle anxiety, we must first grasp their perspectives on emotions. Stoics believe that emotions, including anxiety, arise from our judgments about external events, rather than the events themselves. As uh, Epictetus, a prominent Greek Stoic philosopher, was born into slavery and allowed to study philosophy by his master. Uh, at some point, as an aside, at some point, he became disabled. Celsus, quoted by Origen, wrote that this was because his leg had been deliberately broken by his master. Simplicus, in contrast, wrote that he'd simply been disabled from childhood. So whether his infirmity was deliberate or not is unimportant. Epictetus is frequently shown in pictures with crutches because he, he was basically crippled. So how that came about, we don't know. Um, so there we go. Now he emphasized that men are disturbed not by things, but the views which they take of things. So according to this view, anxiety is not inherent in the circumstances, but rather in our interpretation of them. We are not our thoughts. These are just things that happen to us. They're mental events. We are not our feelings. These are also just events that we experience. And it's up to us whether we give them our assent or not. We can instead simply decide to suspend judgment by becoming indifferent, and in which case then we can maintain our peace of mind. Now, Epictetus famously emphasized the importance of distinguishing between what is within our control and what lies beyond it. He stated, there is only one way to happiness, and that is to cease worrying about things which are beyond the power of our will. By acknowledging that external events are beyond their control, Stoics redirect their focus to their own thoughts, actions and attitudes. Anxiety dissipates when one realizes that it stems from futile attempts to control the uncontrollable. So the modern advice, and I've done this myself, for anyone suffering with anxiety, is to make a list on a sheet of paper and divide it up into three columns marked things under my control, things not under my control, and finally things over which I have partial influence. It goes without saying that the things over which you can control, you don't need to worry about, as you can do anything you like to change a situation should the need arise. Likewise, it's foolish to fret or allow yourself anxieties over things over which you have no control. There's nothing you can do to change it anyway, and worrying isn't going to make any difference. It's just a waste of mental energy that can cause stress and illness in the present. It's better to put your energies into your third column and see where you can leverage your partial influence for best effect. The present moment is made up of a sequence of deterministic events caused by previous events themselves, caused by other previous things in a causal chain as old as time, uh, leading Marcus Aurelius to state, whatever happens to you has been waiting to happen since the beginning of time. The twinning stands of freight, well, both of them together, your own existence and the things that happen to you. So sorry, everybody, I'm still suffering with my throat. Uh, it's the type of thing that would have caused me anxiety years ago, but now I'm indifferent to it because I'm a good stoic. So in other words, all of your present troubles started in the moment of the Big Bang. They're not anybody else's fault, and neither are your own. To a stoic, free will is only limited. Most things come about because of circumstances beyond our control. They completely blindside us. They come out of nowhere, seemingly. So we, however, have the freedom to react to them in a way that is good for us or bad. Our reaction to events is something under our own control. You cannot control the universe, other people or events, but in some cases you can influence them. And that's where we must focus our energies. 
The only place where we can reign supreme and uncontested is within the confines of our own minds. Our present circumstances, whatever they may be, whether deemed good or bad by ourselves or even others, is the fault of the Big Bang, which in modern day parlance is just as apt to saying it's the will of the gods. Or if you're a Christian, it's one particular God, the creator of all things, the architect of the stars, the shaper of the mountains. So if you believe then, you might conclude that it's all God's fault. But not even God decides what goes on within your mind. How you, how you react is down to you. So in this regard, God is blameless. To look at it another way, the anxious man, the angry man, the stressed man, the unhappy man believes himself to be right, whilst the rest of the universe is wrong. The Stoic school began when a Phoenician merchant named Zeno of Citium, either, according to legend, he either survived a shipwreck, in which he lost all of his luggage, or heard that the ship that was carrying his luggage had been wrecked, taking it to the, to the, to the bottom of the ocean, basically. The bulk of his worldly possessions gone. So, in the wake of this unlucky and tragic event, he simply said, Fortune commands me to be a less encumbered philosopher. He wasn't overwhelmed by sadness, neither was he consumed by a loss, or even angry at himself, and the choices that he previously made that led to the loss. He simply shrugged it off and maintained his peace of mind. The luggage would have been nice, but he could manage just as well without it. To a stoic, the past is instantly gone, the future not yet arrived, so peace of mind, or ataraxia, is only available in the present moment. Within the present moment, we are always free to reject anxiety and accept things as they really are, result of the natural order of things. There is nothing bad in nature, and therefore nothing bad in reality, because both reality and nature are one and the same. It is within this present moment that we can choose not to be angry, anxious, upset, and so on. So, a key principle in Stoicism is to embrace the present moment and accept things as they are. This notion is beautifully captured by the philosopher Marcus Rawlius, who stated, The happiness of your life depends upon the quality of your thoughts. A Stoic understands that anxiety arises from clinging to desires, worrying about the future, or regret in the past. By focusing on the present and accepting it without judgment, one can alleviate the burden of anxiety. So we'll deal with the future when it comes, when it becomes the present and not beforehand. There is no need to worry. Everything that we need to cope with unforeseen events is already inside of us. We have the rational faculty or logos, beloved of the Stoics, because it separates us from all of the other animals. Rationality forms the bedrock of Stoic philosophy, offering an antidote to anxious thoughts, Stoics practice rational deliberation and critical examination of their fears. They question whether their anxieties are based on facts or merely products of the imagination. As Epictetus advised, if you wish to be a writer of tra tragedies, you must yourself be aware of the nature of things you're attempting to portray. By understanding the nature of anxiety, Stoics can challenge their fearful thoughts and bring clarity to their minds. Stoicism also places great emphasis on self-discipline as a means to build resilience. Seneca, a prolific playwright, a writer of letters, and a man who lived his philosophy, asserted, he who indulges empty fears earns himself real fears. By cultivating discipline, Stoics aim to detach themselves from anxieties and become masters of their own minds. They recognize that anxiety is often the result of fixating on things beyond their control. Through discipline, a Stoic learns to focus only on what they can influence, empowering themselves to navigate adversity with composure. So whenever we do need to think on future projects, problems or issues, let's just look at the present moment first. And should we wish we could deliberately imagine what can go wrong in a process called premeditatio malorium. That's a good one, isn't it? I'll do that again. Premeditatio malorium. <laughs> Sorry. I'm Welsh, you see, premeditato malorum. I do have a problem with some English words, but there we are. That's life, isn't it? Uh, comprehensive school system and so on. So the active and deliberate premeditation of evils. In other words, we employ our mental energy to think about things that could co possibly go wrong in the near future in a process of negative visualization. And having identified potential issues can work out uh, diligently uh, methods in the presence to mitigate or present them from ever occurring. So in other words, if we're engaged in a project or some enterprise that's really, really important to us and would naturally like push us 
uh, towards uh, anxiety, instead of actually being anxious about terrible things that may or may not happen, we can think, well, okay, well, how is this product likely to fail? How is this project likely to fail? How, how, you know, what would failure look like? How can things go wrong? Okay, so we identify these things that can possibly go wrong. We say, well, okay, well, what can we do to stop them from occurring? And then you make a plan. And then you have a plan to deal with the future. So this is not the same as worrying. Uh, neither does it bring with it, with it anxiety. Uh, rather, it's a deliberate and willful attempt by the mind to apprehend future dangers and be prepared for them. By indulging in this practice, you will soon learn that most of the things that you'd normally worry about never ever come to pass. So likewise, the opportunity to put some real mental energy into potential threats to your endeavours will soothe and calm you in the present moment. Before soldiers go into battle, it's natural that they feel anxious. After all, their lives are on the line, but soldiers who apprehend future dangers and strategize ways of overcoming them tend to feel much better in the present moment about their odds and potential for victory than those that don't. So in other words, you have a plan. If you plan the battle, chances are you're going to win. And that's what Stoicism does for you. So Stoics advocate for the cultivation of inner equanimity of in the face of anxiety inducing situations as Seneca proclaimed we suffer more often in imagination than in reality now that last quote from Seneca we suffer more often in imagination than in reality is really really important so I want you to if you can cast your mind back perhaps six months or a year ago even two years ago and try and remember the things that made you anxious then the things that you were worried about and uh how many of them come to pass? The answer is probably none, or very few, or just one or two. And that tells you then basically that worrying, if you like, projecting your fear into the future is a waste of mental energy. But if you have something that you can do, and you can plan for the way things that might fail, uh, and then you can mitigate that by saying, well, okay, I've imagined a future path now where failure is a reality. What can I do then to avoid that future? Where can I put my energies? How can we avoid this this particular path of failure? And by doing so, we maximize our chances of success. Now, Stoics strive to detach their peace of mind from external circumstances, developing a sense of calm regardless of the chaos around them. By anchoring themselves in their own virtue and reason, they fortify their inner resilience against the storms of anxiety. In a world filled with uncertainty and anxieties, Stoicism offers a transformative approach to finding serenity within oneself. By embracing the principles of Stoic philosophy, individuals can learn to navigate anxiety with wisdom and resilience. So let me just finish this off now with um, a real-world example. I've got a cat. I love the cat. He's a wonderful cat. You might have heard him clattering around in the background when I was actually just uh, in the middle of recording this now, uh, walking over the keyboard, doing all of the cat stuff on the computer, as he does. Now, he used to be a feral cat, but I, I tempted him in. I, f I fed him. Um, I made him feel safe. And then he became our cat. But because he was fully grown when he came to us, and uh, he still had the propensity of cats to roam, even after he'd been to the vet and we'd had him neutered. So he does like to go out occasionally. And the weather's been very warm lately. Uh, he likes to go out. We live in the countryside, and off he goes. And when the weather gets very, very hot, he has this habit of disappearing for two or three days. And um, normally, I don't tend to worry about him. But a really, really strange event happened to me the other night when I was drifting off to sleep. These three thoughts came into my mind unbidden. Um, and I know they weren't my thoughts. They were projected in from um, an outside entity, I think, of uh, my other two cats, basically, with this particular cat, um, sitting on the patio outside the house, enjoying the heat and the sun, basking in it like they do, with a third cat, a black cat, um, they're enjoying as well. And uh, it hit my mind with the force of a bullet as I was drifting off to sleep. And I thought, that's strange. And then a minute or two later, it happened again. And then, of course, you know, uh, a, th a minute after that, it happened again. And then I finally managed to get some sleep. And I wasn't too bothered because I'd seen my particular black cat literally an hour before. He'd been on the bed curled up with us. But when we got up in the morning, he wasn't there. He'd gone out. He'd gone out overnight through an open window. Um, and that was Monday. 
uh, basically we didn't see him all day Tuesday and uh, finally then like say you know I was starting to, to, to worry a bit and, and fret because like, it's now Wednesday and there's no sign of him and I thought those three things these random thoughts that hit me like a bullet the other night are they symbolic in some way is there some sort of like it's my subconscious telling me that perhaps the cat has died or something terrible has happened to him he's been run over somewhere and then the old anxiety started to come back and uh, I immediately reminded myself, well, actually, I'm stoic. And these events are beyond my control. If the cat has gone out and some misfortune has happened to him, there's nothing I can do about it. I wouldn't know where to find a dead cat, say, for instance, um, if he's been run over or something unpleasant has happened to him um, or whatever. I, I wouldn't know. But on the other hand, he could be absolutely fine, in which case, when he's had enough of exploring the outside world, he'll, he'll come back to me. Um, so I decided then to put these anxieties, if you like, out of my mind over that, knowing that whatever the outcome was, it's beyond my control anyway. The cat does what the cat does. The cat acts in accordance with his own nature. And this afternoon, uh, about four o'clock, he turned up. I was making a cup of tea and uh, looking out the window. And there he was walking through the neighbor's garden and he hopped up on the wall and he came in as if nothing had happened. And I immediately opened a tin of food for him because he was starving. He'd lost a lot of weight. He was really, really hungry. And uh, and now here he is now, my best friend here, sitting here on my lap and being stroked and purring and walking around the desk and the keyboard. And it's like he's never, ever been away. But the point being is that in my imagination, for a few moments, terrible things had happened to him. And... That's my whole point about worry, about stress. Um, if I hadn't had the tools of stoicism, then I would have spent two or three days fretting and really, really worrying about the cat because I love the cat. He's a member of my family. Um, and now he's back. And all that mental energy would have been wasted. So there we go. So there, there are practical uses to this very, very old philosophy. Um, and uh, it's done wonders for me. Because as a human being, I'm naturally a depressive man. I'm a melancholy type of uh, soul. And when these feelings of like stress and depression and melancholia and so on, they come over me, I remind myself that I'm a stoic and I don't have to give these feelings my assent. It's not the same as repressing them. You recognize and you accept that those feelings are there, but you don't have to agree with them. And then immediately I find that my mood lifts, that it improves, that my peace of mind is returned. Um, and this, this this takes a long time to do. You, you know, it it doesn't come instantly when you begin with stoic practice. But it is something that you keep on doing and doing. Um, and it gets easier over time until your peace of mind becomes sort of self-assured. What I also find to be good as well when it comes to the, the, the dealing with anxiety is to read the old work. So if you can read Epictetus, um, the handbook, Enchiridion. Um, that's it's not a Welsh word. It's a Greek word. Uh, Enchiridion, Enchiridion. I don't know how you pronounce it because I'm a product of uh, comprehensive schools, as I mentioned earlier on. So I'm learning as well. Um, so, so yeah, there is that. So read the handbook. Read How to Live, the Ben White translation by, of uh, Masonius Rufus's discourses. They're good. Marcus Aurelius, Meditations, fantastic. Uh, outstanding work because these the people of the ancient world apart from Seneca who was very 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 rich and could afford to write endlessly uh, were quite poor and they were limited in resources and that meant that they had to be people of few words so they had to really really work out their thoughts boil them down to the bare minimum and punch them out onto um, limited amounts of papyrus or with ink and uh, of course, that means that they're very, very easy to read and they get to the point. A lot of the modern philosophy you, you read, well, you could get like entire books, basically, which could be summed up in paragraphs by these guys um, from the ancient world. Seneca is a little bit different because he was a prolific like, writer of letters uh, and books and all sorts of things. Um, and uh, his intellectual content is very, very good. He's a good stoic from that point of um, regard. But because he was super rich, 
he didn't experience any of these limitations of the others. Um, now, it's worth bearing in mind that Marcus Aurelius, being emperor of Rome, he obviously could have had anything that he wanted to do, but he was so wed to duty that he spent the bulk of his life, the bulk of his reign, on the frontier, defending Rome from barbarians. So where he was, supplies were limited again. And again, that shows in his thinking. So what I would say is read the Stoics. Read the, read the easy Stoics. So that's Epictetus, Marcus Aurelius, Bisonius Rufus. And um, the more often you read them, the more it changes your brain chemistry, for want of a better term. The more you become like them, they become your friends, they become your peers. And the magical thing about having peers like that is that you become like them. And this is one of the, the fundamental things about, about reading well, especially if you suffer from any type of mental health condition. Be really, really choosy of the media that you expose yourself to. So, you know, read the right books, read from the best people, read from the finest minds in history. Watch TV that edifies you, that doesn't talk down to you. Um, the same applies to anything you might find on Amazon Prime or Netflix or anything like that. Just, you know, be careful as to what you put into your mind. Because, like it or not, human beings are shaped by everything that they encounter. And that's all I can say on the subject. So I'll uh, leave you with that then. So thank you very much, everybody, for listening. And uh, hopefully we'll have another podcast for you next week on how to be happy, how to live the good life. And uh, we'll see what, uh, what more we can do. Thanks now. Bye.